Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, <clears throat> in order to address uh, in the best way probably uh, how to break the barriers to oral nutritional supplementation and how to address optimal strategies to address malnutrition, indeed an important issue is uh, the topic of uh, health economics. So I will not stress you with uh, uh, a large... Uh, large uh, list of numbers. Uh, I'm a clinical nutrition specialist. I'm doing some research in health economics. So, so what I want to do with my lecture is to make some spotlights, to provide some spotlights, on which could be the important issues to be addressed while dealing with the issue of uh, oral nutritional supplementation. So probably uh, Many of us are not familiar with this topic, uh, and what uh, I want uh, to provide is just to, uh, an insight, so why it is important also this topic, because it, it closely related to uh, one of the main barriers in providing uh, uh, good access to nutritional care. This is also the outcome of the recent uh, uh, ONCA conference held in Turin, we spend a lot of time this kind with many, many specialists all over uh, Europe uh, about the topic of malnutrition and the importance of, all, of uh, collecting data in, uh, uh, in the health economics, uh, uh, with health economics studies. Uh, costs are important. And uh, uh, these are also important uh, for uh, uh, increasing the access to uh, nutritional care. And despite we have a, a large mass of data from uh, health economic studies, uh, we do need to collect more data to convince research allocators that uh, uh, even nutritional care could play an important role uh, in improving the patient outcome. So that's why uh, we are asking why focusing on the health economics. Uh, uh, indeed, the healthcare system are challenged by the high and escalating costs of care but at the same time, with increasing costs, what we do need to do in our daily practice is uh, to implement practices that are bringing benefits to the patient, but are also cost effective. And this is what they are looking at, resource allocators. They are not dealing with the health of the patient. They are dealing with the cost. And uh, if we can improve the outcome of the patient, improving specifically reducing the costs, we, we win the challenge. And uh, we can do this in, in several ways. Uh, there are different tools to address uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of health economics. What we do with health economic study is to evaluate the impact of a medical condition, so the burden for the system, for the patient. But at the same time, we address the costs that are related to the care of this disease, and in particular, now we are focusing on the cost of nutritional care, just to understand which is the benefit compared to the money invested in treating the patient. This is the cost-benefit analysis. But what is even more important uh, is the concept of uh, under, 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 that is to say, Malnutrition is under-recognized, malnutrition is underestimated, malnutrition is under-treated, uh, malnutrition is uh, under-coded. So if we look, for example, to some of the data available in literature, you can see that, uh, for example, in the community, and this is analysis conducted in the US, uh, the cost related to disease-related malnutrition, at least for eight main diseases, not for all the diseases, so the picture would be even worse, it's associated with uh, an increase of about $500 per resident per year. But if you address another setting, for example, the hospital setting, that's been estimated in uh, 2021 that the cost of managing malnutrition in the hospital setting is approximately $60 billion. This is in the UK. But this is on a ICD-based diagnosis. And the prevalence measured in this study of malnutrition was only 9%. And we know that the picture is even worse. So 
one of the major problem is the fact that malnutrition is undercoded. So again, we are still underestimating the problem. And uh, only coding malnutrition at discharge can bring money to the hospital. So this is an important issue, because if we talk with our general medicine resource allocator in an hospital setting, and they are also health economists, they are dealing with costs, because uh, hospital are industries are producing money. It's, uh, it's not good to tell, but anyway, this is the, the, the reality. And uh, only coding malnutrition can bring more gain for the hospital. And this is for the cancer setting, in which probably the issue of malnutrition compared to the, to the problems related to this disease uh, is not so high. So if we split this picture to all the other diseases, the situation probably is uh, even, even worse. So if we look uh, to a single country, because a major problem in, uh, in health economics analysis is that we are, for example, analyzing prevalence data from one country, but, but we have uh, estimation of the cost related to, an, to, to malnutrition that has been done in another country, so we are combining the situation in different countries. So if we do a specific analysis in a single country, considering the cost of the single country and the dimension of the problem, and we can see that the picture is up to 50% in adults, and in old adults is even higher, you can see that we are talking about billion euros in terms of money spent due to the increase in the length of stay, and money spent in for example, readmission to hospital that can be prevented by appropriate nutritional care. Even more important, the cost that we had to look at that are mainly related to treating the morbidity and not in the money invested, not depending on the money invested for treating malnutrition, approximately 5%. That is to say that most of the costs are not related to nutritional intervention. So something that can be implemented in a very cost-effective way. And this is a picture only for direct costs, uh, that is to say mortality, length of hospital stay, uh, institutionalization, uh, nutritional support, something that we can measure easily. But there are also hidden costs, the indirect costs, for example, those related to insurance costs, pro uh, loss of productivity, these are something that are not easy to estimate and not easy to count in all the budget, but even play a role. But we are dealing with the issue of oral nutritional supplementation. So we, if we have to address uh, the, um, the cost-benefit analysis, a key issue is uh, the fact that uh, uh, our intervention is uh, taken by the patient. This is a big issue because, because nutrition is not taking a pill. And we have already listened from the brilliant previous lecture that there are so many problems related to food intake, so many problems that need to be uh, faced in daily practice. The problem of uh, appetite, the problem of uh, uh, providing to patients high energy uh, density uh, uh, meals. So that's why the use of oral nutritional supplements, because we are considering cost-benefit analysis of oral nutritional supplements, oral nutritional supplements could be an effective intervention in increasing the energy intake, the protein intake of our patient compared to standard nutritional counseling, particularly if we are relying on the use of energy-dense formulations. So those that uh, have an energy content higher than two kilocalories per ml. Because every sip counts in daily practice. And sometimes the problem of compliance is the, one of the most important that we need to face. Sometimes we have to adjust the taste of our nutritional supplements. Sometimes we have to adjust the energy density, the texture. So we do need an effective strategy. And oral nutritional supplements are an effective strategy, 
particularly if we stress even more the recommended target for energy and protein intake in this patient population. If we look at uh, the recommended target and uh, what we can do in daily practice, really, there is no discussion reasonably. There is a big rationale of providing our nutritional supplements. Because, for example, if we address uh, the low protein intake in the community setting, that is to say, a really uncomplicated setting, and we rely only on dietary advice, you can see that over time, over three, six months, only half of the patients are able to reach the recommended target of 1.2, which is for the general population, and which is even higher, for example, during acute or chronic conditions. So dietary advices alone frequently are not enough and we need to invest money in effective strategies. Oral nutritional supplements could be a solution. So we do need to evaluate their impact also in terms of costs. And cost benefits analysis are useful in this way because we are addressing uh, the cost of an intervention, which are expressed not only in terms of health outcomes, but also in terms of costs. And with this analysis, we can also compare different interventions that is to say, for example, nutritional counseling alone com com compared to those combined with systematic provision of oral nutritional supplements. In this way, probably cost-effectiveness analyses are uh, a siding partner to have more convincing data. Because in this way, we can really compare two interventions related to the outcome of the patient. But the outcome sometimes is only one or two. The overall benefit should be perceived over several health outcomes, quality of life, and not only the rate of infection, mortality, length of stay, and so on. We have different studies to address uh, the issue of health economics, uh, particularly the cost-benefit analysis. These are randomized trials, but even more important, real-world evidence study and quality improvement program. Indeed, they are different studies because they have strengths, but also have limitations. And these are related to many issues. The perspective that we are addressing, the risk of selection bias, the sample size, the costs, the outcomes that we can evaluate, the compliance, so adherence to treatment. For example, in a randomized trial, the adherence is uh, reasonably higher compared to, to daily practice, because we are pushing quite a lot on having the patient complying to our intervention. But the major problem is that we are selecting, for example, a specific population, a specific disease condition with some inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we are restricting the picture on a specific set of patients. And at the same time, we are losing some generalizability of our results. That's why probably real-world evidence that provide more uh, rough data are probably more useful to convince research allocators because we are covering a larger uh, number of diseases, we are covering a, a more heterogeneous population, and uh, uh, we can rely on the use of pre-existing data, we can improve the collection with, uh, with additional ones. So we have more generalizable data that can enable to improve access to nutritional care. And there is a strong evidence. We have now several studies and several meta-analyses. These are usually addressing randomized clinical trials, so with the limitation that we have just talked about. But uh, all these studies, most of these studies, agree that uh, there is a cost-benefit positive cost-benefit uh, uh, perspective in using oral nutritional supplements. This applies to the hospital setting, for example, the surgical setting in which we can reduce the rate of mortality, the rate of infections. Most of our complications are related to infections related to malnutrition. We can reduce the length of hospital stay. If we consider that uh, one day is about 800 euros, you can see that for every patient that we are reducing 
two days, the length of stay, we are saving 1,600 uh, euros. But there are also costs related to uh, other complications, indirect costs uh, of, uh, of malnutrition. And good evidence is available also for the community at the own care setting. We have meta-analysis that demonstrate that we have a reduction of the number of hospitalization. We cannot reduce mortality, but we can reduce the cost related to unexpected or unintended hospitalization. We can improve quality of life, the rate of infection, the reduction of uh, post-operative complications, faults, functional limitations. But we have to consider that most of the evidence is related for short-term intervention. The major problem of long-term intervention is the compliance. So we do need to implement effective strategies in the short term that enable to improve the outcome and are also cost beneficial for the patient. So just to summarize with some take-home messages, uh, indeed, the nutritional care brings value to healthcare. We can improve the quality of our care and we can improve the outcome. But indeed, these data must be used to increase the access to nutritional care. This is a major barrier. I'm a nutrition specialist and in daily practice, what I, I'm used to stress is the fact that I am a prescriptor and I do need to see the patient. And this is to say that the patient must be referred to a nutrition specialist. This is also a barrier to improve access to nutritional care. Because if we don't see the patient, we cannot prescribe, we cannot get benefit from nutritional care. And we do need to build up a multidisciplinary a team into the hospital or create at least a, a, a management flow for a, a, specific disease settings and put activity to all the patients that can get benefits, being malnourished, being uh, old adults, and being uh, underestimated and undertreated. But policies should be implemented for the, for the reduction of uh, direct cost and indirect cost too, that unfortunately now are still underestimated. That is to say that we do need more studies in this, uh, in this setting. The problem is still the same. Malnutrition is underestimated. Malnutrition is undercoded. The cost of malnutrition are underestimated. The patient when nourished are undertreated. And we do need more data to increase access to nutritional care. And uh, uh, in this way, also, health economics can be of help because uh, Stressing resource allocator, we can do more for improving the system. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>